from West Virginia Public Broadcasting. West Virginia has produced noted scientists and technicians, mathematicians and engineers, who have made their mark on the state, the nation, and the world, including an astrophysicist from Morgantown and a cancer researcher from Big Chimney. Today, their stories are inspiring West Virginia students to soar. Go from eight inch and start. Four, three, two, one. And lift off, lift off on Columbia and its return to flight. When the Space Shuttle Columbia lifted off in December 1990, it carried in its Astro One payload four telescopes, including the world's first space launched X ray telescope called Broadband. Broadband was designed and built at the Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland, and a young woman from West Virginia in her 20s at the time, was given an extraordinary opportunity to become a pioneer in X-ray astronomy. That telescope was really the first X-ray telescope of its kind, and I was lucky enough to be a grad student, the only main grad student on that project, doing a lot of the analysis and calibration with the scientists. So I got several really good papers out of that and my thesis, and some new discoveries came out of my thesis work. So I was in a position to be an X-ray pioneer, a pioneer in X-ray astronomy, with the team at NASA Goddard who flew BBXRT in 1990. My name is Kim Weaver. Um, I grew up in Morgantown, West Virginia at Sheet Lake in Monongalia County. Today we're at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center where I'm an astrophysicist for NASA. And an astrophysicist is a scientist who is a physicist, I'm trained as a physicist, and I study objects in the sky like stars and galaxies and black holes. As a very young scientist, Weaver made pioneering discoveries about black holes. She wrote articles for important scientific journals about how black holes and new stars often go together. In a television documentary, she demonstrated how black holes suck everything inside. The gravitational pull is so powerful that anything that falls near a black hole will be forever trapped. Not even light can escape. It's a mind-boggling concept that something invisible is detectable and offers a view to our ultimate fate. This black tarp represents space, and space is relatively flat, but when you put a massive object into space, it curves it. This is a penny, and notice how it comes into a really beautiful circular orbit. Basically, the black hole trapped it into an orbit around itself and that orbit becomes very circular as it gets closer. And now the penny will eventually disappear, go inside the black hole. Kim Weaver's work on the disks around black holes launched a whole new field in astronomy. Later, as the head of public outreach for NASA Goddard, Kim spent many years explaining the mysteries of the universe to the outside world. Today, Kim works full-time as a NASA research scientist still trying to uncover the secrets of the universe. Typically what I would do when I'm working on a project that's a science project is that I'm working with colleagues or students or postdoctoral researchers and we obtain information, data from a satellite based on a proposal that I write and uh, hopefully win time for. And then we are studying a specific problem, you know, a certain thing that's going on inside of a galaxy or something we want to understand about um, some physical phenomenon. And so I work on the computer and I make plots and graphs and charts of information and we sit down and we talk about that and we study it and try to understand what it means. And when we figure that out, we write a paper. 
The main tools that I use in my work every day are, well, number one, some probably very expensive satellite that's flying in, in space to get the data from, and so that is, contains all kinds of equipment. I run the data through my computer program on my desk, and I analyze it using software that's been produced by people who work on data like this. Using images from the Chandra X-ray Telescope, Kim has been studying a galaxy called NGC 253. This is a typical ground-based astronomy image from a telescope that, you know, you might see on TV or something, just a telescope that astronomers have used in the past. And it's an edge-on spiral galaxy, so you can see the dust lane here. And in the optical, it looks just like you'd expect a galaxy to look. It looks very galaxy-like, right? Um, but then this is a picture of that same galaxy, so I'll put them side by side with the Chandra X-ray telescope. And these are data that, that I was able to win telescope time to get these data. And you can see that the X-ray picture looks really different from the visible light image because you have the, this blob in the center here. That's where the black hole lives, way down in the center of this galaxy. And you can see X-rays from material that's coming away from the black hole here or being lit up by um, the pressure around the black hole. And then you can see the little dots here. All of these little dots are X-ray sources that are individual, possibly X-ray binary systems or even maybe intermediate mass black holes that are accreting material around them. So the galaxy looks very different in X-ray light versus optical light. What I love about my job is the ability to do things like this, talk to people, um, interact with other people, talk about the cool things that we do at NASA, uh, talk to educators and students, be involved in reaching out to the public. For a number of years, astronomers like Kim Weaver have been surprised by the way galaxies behave. Our observations of things we could see, like galaxies, weren't uh, making a lot of sense to us. I like to also talk to scientists and be involved in hearing what they're doing and kind of getting in on the ground floor of understanding what cool discoveries we're making. I think that the average physicist I was looking online to find this out, starting out after getting their PhD, it's roughly, you know, $65,000 a year or so. I do more than just do science at NASA, so my salary right now doesn't really reflect um, just what a scientist would do because I've been also a manager. You know, it ends up being a salary that's 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 about a hundred, hundred ten thousand dollars a year or so. That's very, very nice for people in their mid-career path. Kim's interest in space started when she was five years old. My great grandmother lived in um, near Green Bank, West Virginia, and my great grandfather also did. Back then, when you drove past the Green Bank Observatory, you could get a very good look at the big telescope dish. We would drive by and I would say to him, Grandpa, what is that? And he'd say, well, that's the, that's the dinner plate that the Jolly Green Giant uses to have his dinner. And I'd say, no, it's not. That's, you're wrong. He's like, yes, it is. And I said, I know that's a telescope. And so I would say to him, I'm going to use that telescope someday. But it turns out I did use that telescope. I used the telescope to work with a scientist at Maryland to help another graduate student out. And um, I studied, I actually found a new galaxy with that telescope that was part of another girl's thesis. So um, it wasn't my science discovery but I located it with the telescope and um, that was pretty exciting because unfortunately my grandfather didn't live to see that day but I, I followed through with what I said I was going to do. <laughs> also when Kim was five she was in a serious car accident. Go ahead. When I was five years old we landed on the moon and I was hit by a car that day and put in the hospital and I remember being so upset that I was not going to see the moon landing. That's one small step for man. That was a fundamental one turning point for me. Ever since that day, I wanted to work for NASA. So I'm here now, today. Despite long-term injuries from the car accident, physical challenges and pain that continued for decades, Kim loved middle school. She loved science, music, and words.
I loved words. I loved reading. Um, I loved animals. I wanted to be a veterinarian. And then the next day I wanted to be an astronaut. And I was always changing my mind. I was running around my father's campground in the summertime. That's what I would do at the summer is, is just be up there and be part of nature. And I loved exploring things and walking around and climbing trees. And, and I wouldn't let anyone tell me, you can't be this, this, or this. I just refuse to listen to that and you know that would be my advice to anyone actually if I were asked is just don't listen to what other people tell you you are try things first and then find out what you're good at and do that at West Virginia University Kim majored in physics she was also the field conductor of the WVU marching band and was named Ms Mountaineer when I went to college I didn't really think I was going to become an astronomer at first I started out taking every class I could because I wanted to learn about every field that I could. So I took psychology classes, I took biology, I took geography, I took everything, music, history, I loved history, political science. Um, and so over the first couple of years that I was a student, I began to realize I really liked science. And so I kind of begin, began to transition into physics. If I learned physics, I could then do any science I wanted. I could do any technology endeavor I wanted because physics underlies everything. In terms of being a scientist, and in fact even a kind of a high-powered scientist because you really do have to kind of fight and scramble to get resources, I think the, you know a person has to be uh, very dedicated. Um, you have to be interested in learning all the time. You never learn everything. It's always something new. You have to be interested in working with people because even though, you know, people say scientists are not that social, they actually do need to be able to do that sort of thing and communicate what they're trying to do and explain things well. Um, you have to have really good writing skills. You know, language is important and full writing skills. One of the things I've noticed that I've had trouble with some students in terms of their ability to succeed is that they don't develop those writing skills very early on, so that's important. Though Kim Weaver lives a few hours away, West Virginia and the university are still important to her. West Virginia to me is an image in my head. It is trees and mountains. It's a smell, the air. It's a sound, the birds the uh, water, waterfalls. I, I, I'm convinced that had I grown up somewhere else, I would have never developed the appreciation of nature and the natural world the way I did. My name is Lewis Cantley. I'm director of the Cancer Center at Weill Cornell Medical College and New York Presbyterian Hospital. A native of Big Chimney, West Virginia, Lewis Cantley is a world-renowned biochemist and molecular biologist. He made one of the most important scientific discoveries of the last 50 years. It's something so small, it would just be a dot on the world's most sophisticated electron microscope. I became interested in how cells communicate to each other, how growth factors and hormones tell cells what to do, in particular how they tell cells to grow. And In the process of doing that work, I discovered an enzyme called PI3K. It actually stands for phosphoinositide 3-kinase. The tiny PI3K enzyme helps explain the growth of a cell and ultimately the growth of a child to an adult. It's also the key to a link between obesity, type 2 diabetes, and a higher risk of cancer. That enzyme turns out to control glucose uptake into tissues in your body. It's how insulin mediates effects in your body. It is the most mutated gene in cancer. And when it's mutated and hyperactivated, it tells your cancer cells to take up sugar and they can take up sugar better than your muscle, and as a consequence, they grow instead of your muscle growing. And we now understand that's a frequent cause of cancer is due to activation of this enzyme.
For most of his scientific career, Lewis Cantley led a research lab at Harvard University Medical School in Boston. In recent years, he's also led groups of cancer researchers from all over the world. They work together to speed up new discoveries in how to treat cancer. In 2014, Dr. Cantley was recruited to lead the brand new Sandra and Edward Meyer Cancer Center in New York City, part of the Weill Cornell Medical College and New York Presbyterian Hospital. It's likely to become one of the most important cancer research centers in the world. Since I have taken on the position of the Cancer Center Director and moving my laboratories from Harvard to Weill Cornell, it's an incredibly busy day because I'm in transition. Over the past year, I've had laboratories at both locations, so I go back and forth between Boston and New York every week. Of course, I'm also recruiting new people. Lewis Cantley's new labs are located in a brand new building across the street from the medical college. So the way these labs are built, uh, first of all, we bring in a whole lot of light, so the end of the lab is entirely glass. You can see the background scenery of New York City, the high-rise buildings. We're currently on the 13th floor. And even the lunch area, which is on the other side of that glass wall, is completely visible to the laboratory. So people who are eating can see who's working in the lab and vice versa. So really designed to make a maximum interaction between people who are doing science so that they have a chance to talk to other people about what they're doing, uh, get excited about what they're doing, get input, criticism, advice and doing it in a very friendly, open, and bright, sunny environment. Cantley typically works from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. or later. I have about 200 emails every day that I have to read seriously and respond to. I have to admit that a few days I don't quite get to the end before I collapse and go out for dinner. <laughs> so that's a typical day in my life. What I love about the job is that this is an incredible opportunity for me. I've been a basic scientist discovering signaling networks that drive cancer and also explain how insulin works. Pharmaceutical companies have now begun to develop the drugs that hit the targets that my laboratory has, has identified. And those drugs are now going into clinical trials and some of them are being approved already. It's an incredibly exciting time to see that the basic research one has done is now resulting in uh, cures or, or at least dramatic improvements in diseases that have in the past been very difficult to treat. For his work in the discovery of the PI3K enzyme, Lewis Cantley has received many national and international awards and honors. He was in the first group of scientists to win the new Breakthrough Prize in Life Sciences, worth $3 million. Some colleagues speculate that Lewis Cantley may one day win a Nobel Prize. Top-level scientists can make a very good living. I make more money than the President of the United States, but less money than a basketball player. <laughs> yes, I get paid quite well for what I do, because people are paid well for doing this cutting-edge research. But it takes many years to get to Dr. Cantley's level. Graduate students earn about twenty-five to thirty thousand dollars a year, and once qualified, biochemists and research biologists start at around forty thousand to one hundred and twenty thousand dollars a year. Lewis Cantley spent all his early life in West Virginia. I grew up in Big Chimney, West Virginia. Went to elementary school at Big Chimney. Went to junior high school at Elkview and went to high school at Herbert Hoover. I had loved chemistry from the time I was, I don't know, eight years old. I got a chemistry kit for Christmas one year and started mixing things together and making, seeing them change color or usually they just turned into some kind of a gluey substance that was brown and stuck to the table I was working on. <laughs> the eighth grade, I absolutely loved basketball. This was back in the 60s, Jerry West was my idol. And I remember every single day when the lunch bell rang, I immediately zipped to the, tried to get to the lunchroom, grab something and eat it within five to 10 minutes so I could get out to the basketball, outdoor basketball court where we had pickup games. Lou is the second of four children who grew up on a farm outside Big Chimney, West Virginia. Their father, Clayton Cantley, worked for Union Carbide 
and Mother Clarice studied to become a teacher while she had four small children at home. Lewis's two brothers, Larry and Lloyd, also became research scientists as well as medical doctors. Their parents encouraged the children to be curious about everything. Sister Linda was always the boss. When they were little, I was always the big sister. And I was the leader. I was the encourager. I, I always liked to see them succeed, and I always liked to remind them that they could do anything. Linda chose to go to college at West Virginia Wesleyan in Buchanan. Eventually, her brothers followed, and all four were top students. Recently, Lewis Cantley was invited back to Wesleyan to give the commencement address. My most serious advice is to be aware of your talents, to seek out environments where your ideas can be challenged and your talents can be honed. So take that raw material, the diamond in the rough, and convert it into the diamond. It was a time when the whole Cantley family, including three brothers who ended up in medical research, gathered to talk about growing up together and why they became scientists. We were raised to question things, and I was sort of the one that, if something broke, I was going to try to fix it. Like we had gasoline-powered motors and lawnmowers and tractors and things like that, and I just loved the, how is this put together? Why is it not working right? What would it take to fix it, put it back on the road, and working again? So I think ideally, and if I did it over again, I'd probably be a surgeon because I really love the hands-on fixing things, but also like the psychological, okay, why is this the way it is? And if we impact this, what would its effects on this organism's, or in this case, humans' behavior be? So I kind of like the, the thought of changing person's lives, not just fixing the immediate thing that was wrong. My name is Lloyd Cantley. I'm the youngest of the Cantley family. Uh, I currently live in Connecticut and I'm a professor at Yale University. Uh, I'm also a professor of medicine I and mean, I have a laboratory where my lab studies kidney diseases. So I'm a kidney specialist clinically and see patients with kidney disease. As the youngest uh, of the Cantley family, actually I had like a golden path. So um, people might have asked whether we were competitive or whether my brother, you know, I had trouble like always having to live up, it was exactly the opposite. Every time I walked into a new situation, they're going, oh, you're a Cantley, okay. And just assume that I was going to work hard and study and know things. And, and when I didn't, I got asked why that was. And so it was made it actually quite easy to uh, pay attention and, and do what I was supposed to do um, and not get waylaid by all of the various things that happen when you're in school. Becoming a scientist like the Cantley brothers requires a broad understanding of biology, chemistry, physics, and mathematics. But Lewis Cantley says there's something even more important than that, something he needed that surprised him, learning to use the English language. I have to communicate the observations that I make. I have to write them up, publish them in journals, do it in an efficient way that a broad audience can understand, and give talks. Virtually every day I give a talk somewhere to some audience, and often a lay audience, and I look at the people who train with me, and I can almost tell right off, independent of whether someone is a good scientist and is good, good at working in the lab, if they can't write that very clear description of what they're doing to me, I know that they're ultimately, there's going to be a ceiling as to how far they get in their career. Lewis Cantley has not only succeeded in science, but also in communicating that science to others. He credits much of his success to West Virginia. West Virginia is where my whole personality, my whole education came from. I am West Virginia. <laughs> Basically, my whole philosophy of life, the way I behave, the way I interact with people, was all established from my upbringing in West Virginia.
Inspiring West Virginians is made possible by the generous support of the Miles Family Foundation. Inspiring West Virginians to soar. From West Virginia Public Broadcasting.